My name's Paul Connell. You'll pick up some of the other um, open access last team. With, uh, some of them have got backgrounds, some have got nice uh, logos. Um, I'm Paul. Uh, Mark Farr, who usually co chairs these with me, is currently in a meeting deciding whether or not to keep Kent's uh, Nightingale Hospital. So uh, we let him off. I think it's quite an important decision. And they're using data to do it, obviously. Um, so that's uh, any time. And something we've all noticed is that um, the expectation of having great data available very quickly um, has become the norm in many aspects of everyone's lives. And that the, um, the pandemic has amplified that significantly. So we're really happy today to have two people who've been in the middle of all of that and who are very well versed in managing people's expectations of data and timeliness and pace and what it means and what it doesn't mean um, with us today. So we've got Claire and Pariah who are the, who be, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna steal lesson there, but who are in the middle of the UK's um, COVID dashboard. I'll keep filling until about five past, which um, lets people uh, join. I don't have to do exits and uh, restrooms, but obviously if you do need to leave us, just um, uh, feel free, get yourself a brew. And if you have any questions as we go along, we've just only got one talk or two people giving one talk today because we wanted to give it enough time uh, to do it justice. So if people would like to um, add their questions to the chat, that would be great. Please feel free to share screenshots and commentary uh, online. Obviously, hashtag open that says live. Um, we'll put the link um, to the, um, the Twitter handle in the, in the chat. I'll also put a link to um, the Open Air Says Lives website where this talk will appear um, either uh, once it's been processed either this afternoon or tomorrow. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll either take them at an appropriate time in the um, talk or we'll take them at the end um, and myself and the uh, the, uh, the uh, Open Data Science Live team will, will, will pull them together uh, as we go. So we've got about 30 seconds left before we, we start. Who's going to be up first in the, in the talk? So I'm first. Puri is going to share the slides, though, and do the whole next slide, please, scenario. Yes, OK. Fantastic. Well, we, we, that's, we're keeping on with brand there. So um, we've got 45 people who have logged on. Um, I'm going to wait for the, the minute to tick over to 12.05 so we, we keep up with our um, time scales. Um, and over to Claire and Pariah to, uh, Poria to do that. I'm, I'm hoping you do do the next slide, please, um, uh, uh, on this, because we're all used to that. <laughs> So thank yeah, very over, much. over to you, Claire. Great, thank you. So thanks for inviting us. So um, I'm Claire Griffiths. Um, I am the head of the UK COVID dashboard team in the UK Health Security Agency, formerly Public Health England. Um, and Korea will introduce himself when it gets to his section of the talk. I'm just going to basically introduce things and then career or get into some more of the technical details um, on open data. So next slide, please. Okay, so this is what we're hoping to cover, introduction and bit of history. Um, then I'll just talk about the daily process. Um, we've got a section on how we present the data. There's a big section on open data, which is partly slightly missing from this bullet point list, I think. Um, transparency and then obviously time for Q&A. So next slide. So we've, we've given kind of versions of this talk to a number of different groups. And, and one of the bits of feedback we had quite early on was from a, a, someone who'd been involved in the swine flu 
epidemic um, who did a kind of compare and contrast, I suppose, saying that really they didn't have all that much real time data at that that point. Um, and in each primary care trust, if you're old enough to remember them, um, was devising their own monitoring system. Um, and he felt that if they'd had an equivalent to this dashboard, it could have been a lot more efficient in how they gone about managing things. So where are we now? So this is just a bit on the, the service as it currently stands. So we're looking at between half a million and 1.5 million daily users and two to four million a week, up to 80 million weekly page views and 20 to 45 million hits a day. And downloads of data can get up to 1.5 million. And, and at peak time, so that's your four o'clock, when the new data are released, we have around 100 to 200,000 people sitting there hitting refresh on their browser, waiting for the, the new data to land. So the service is having to deal with some pretty high traffic. Okay. And then this, this slide is just showing some of the iterations in design of the, the dashboard. And the bottom right there is the first kind of dashboard dashboard, if you like. Before that, we had an ArcGIS um, map with some headline figures all in different font sizes. And it wasn't too great, to be honest, back in March. Then we launched this first version of the dashboard on gov.uk. Then in about June, July 2020, we moved to the middle of one of those designs, which was really designed to replace the daily press briefings that had been going on up until then. If you can remember, those were a lot of data heavy slides in those presentations and with all the latest information on testing cases, healthcare, deaths, etc. So the dashboard was basically asked to expand from what you see in the bottom right to that middle point of replacing the data that was being given out in the press briefings every day, which is why the, the design there makes those charts look like they're kind of in PowerPoint slides. That was sort of brief, I suppose. And then the third iteration was to give it more of a local focus. So we launched this in October of that year. Um, we didn't have vaccinations on it at that time. Um, that came later. But this kind of UK summary page so to give you a snapshot of the current position and introduce the ability to filter that down by postcode so you get the most local data for your area um, and that that really hugely increased the usage of the dashboard by the general public. So we go on to the next slide. So how do we go about it? I'll just do this quite quickly. So we've, we have a data pipeline which is there on the left hand side um, and the actual kind of data flows themselves kind of start at midnight the night before when the cases data are kind of processed into the system within um, UKHSA, but the pipeline and analysts kind of start around 8 a.m. Um, monitoring the various pipelines, there's 26, I think, maybe slightly more now, actually different data sources that are pipelined in. Um, and processed into 11 different data files that are sent over throughout the day, with the main data file being sent usually around 3 p.m. if everything's run smoothly, which you know happens more often than not, but I don't want to jinx things. As soon as I say, oh, things have been running very well recently, then things start going wrong and we actually send the main data at 10 to 4 and have very limited amount of time for QA. Um, and then it hits the ETL process, which Puri will talk about in a moment. And 
yes work miracles on making that process as quickly as it possibly can calculating all sorts of derived metrics um then we're sort of pushing that to our development site around half past three gives us some time to QA and hopefully see that everything looks as it should before we release it for next slide so I think I mentioned the complexities of the data so this just gives you some idea of some of those numbers so as I said 26 plus different data sources with over 700 million raw figures being processed into around 10 million different figures sent over to the ETL which generates all the derived metrics pumping that number up and then on the right hand side the main database that sits behind the site has over 5 billion records so I mentioned the pipeline this is a visual of what our data pipeline looks like. So each one of those little boxes is a bit of Python, PySpark code that processes the data. Um, so at the top there's vaccination data, at the bottom is the ONS death data. The light green in the middle there is our cases pipeline. I think it's probably it's actually probably got more complex than this since we introduced the reinfections data. There's now more bits of that pipeline processing along. That kind of lands around nine o'clock, and we're pinging over the first files to Puria at about ten thirty. Talking of which, hopefully, yes, the next slide just shows the COVID dashboard admin platform, which we call Greenhouse. I'm not allowed to say that, but that's what it's called um so this is what we see on my side of things where you can see there there's a list of the the 11 different data files that i mentioned the time that they landed with the database and were processed um and then this is from um yesterday's release so you can see they're all ticked as released as they land in there today, they'll that will have a little red cross in it showing that they're not yet released. And once it's all ready, then we are then ready to deploy the data. So I think it's at this point I'm handing over to Puria. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Puria Najibiri, and uh, I am, well, as a the beginning of January, I'm the honorary technical lead of the dashboard. Before that, I was the non-honorary uh, technical and development lead. Um, but yeah. Uh, so um, the the reason why Claire mentioned this is called greenhouse. Uh, there's a there's a reason behind it, and that's because uh, we name our, our different um, service environments after uh, flowers. So our admin environment we ended up calling the, the greenhouse for that reason so that's a bit of a fun fact behind it uh, moving forward um, so the etl as claire mentioned earlier uh, its job is to i mean etl stands for extract transform and load but um, when this service was designed that is exactly what it was doing but over time it has increased in its scale and capacity and what it does and um, as far as the part that Claire mentioned is concerned, it receives the data, it um, then, you know, separates the data out into um, different chunks, if you like, and uh, those chunks are based on the unique combination of area code and area type. So let's say um, for a, a specific borrower in London, there will be a single file. Um, and then it stores them does some processing, calculates up to five, six different derived metrics that would include rolling rates, rolling sum, direction, trajectory, things of that nature. And um, it um, does some uh, you know, automated QA. And uh, once everything is in order, it also ensures that uh, for parts of the data that may be exclusive if, if released as they are, such as MSOI data, it ensures that um, the primary metric is actually removed from the data 
and uh, the derived metrics are only included. And so we only publish rolling rates and on a weekly basis, we don't publish daily number of cases at MSO level because um, it could cause disclosure. Uh, it generates certain reports um, for both QA and to be sent out to um, different individuals across government um, and consolidates the data and stores a copy in our storage for um, you know, uh, future audits and sends one uh, or uploads one copy into our database. Now, this is a, um, this might not sound a lot, but we're talking about uh, a massive volume of data. So we're talking about 50, 60 million uh, you know, records that need to be, um, you know, uploaded yeah, to the database in a very short period of time. At times, we have five, six minutes to um, have the whole thing, especially when, it, when the data are delayed, uh, to have the whole thing into the database or we'll miss the 4 p.m. Um, deadline that we have set so for ourselves. Uh, and that would cause you know, people to start complaining, <laughs> which we don't want to happen. Um, so presentation and uh, why do we show things as, you know, whatever it is that we show them as? Um, so this is a bit of an old uh, extract of the website. When we first introduced vaccinations data, we only had first dose, there was no second dose. And uh, we had to, we sat and, you know, had a meeting uh, for four or five of us um, to decide on what, terminology to use in order to publish the data. And that's, that's very important for a variety of reasons because we have a diverse range of users uh, uh, from different backgrounds. We have people um, who are from an academic background, we have uh, you know, government uh, officials, we have uh, you know, members of the public who do this, you know, who could be informed. Um, so um, different people from different backgrounds means that we need to be very careful about how we present things. And um, it might not immediately, uh, you know, it may not be immediately obvious to, to people um, that we have given something so much consideration, but there is a reason behind it. So for instance, with the, you know, vaccination, first of vaccinations, you can see that all of these and quite a few more and uh, each of these had the potential issue. We needed to make sure that um, the dose is defined when we are you know, highlighting the number of people who've been vaccinated. We, uh, we needed to make sure that we don't um, give false impression that they are now immune, uh, which, which would you know, uh, cause issues and public health issues. Uh, we needed to make sure that the title that we give it is not too verbose in that we didn't want to end up with something that's two sentences as a headline. And we didn't want to you know, give the impression that people have been offered a vaccine, but not actually given a vaccine. So these, were, these are potential issues associated with different um, you know, options that we see here. So given things um, that might appear otherwise very small and you know, trivial uh, tend to require extensive consideration. Then there is the accessibility of the website. As a government website, of course, we are, we are required to provide an accessible environment, which is quite difficult in context because this is not a normal government service. It's not, if you look at Gov UK, uh, you know, environment, what you see is that it is um, quite focused on text and the occasional um, image. It's not really something that's been designed to present data uh, of, this, of this magnitude. And um, of course, it's not really intended for um, being interactive, whereas the dashboard is. Um, so we needed to come up with different strategies and test those strategies. Uh, and one of the most important things is that it, we didn't want to treat it as a box ticking exercise. It was important to us to make the service accessible to as many people as we could possibly, uh, you know, uh, accommodate. So uh, for that reason, we ensured that uh, because the service is pretty much a bespoke design and implementation, we ensured that everything, um, you know, uh, is 
structured correctly so that it is easy for screen readers to, um, to understand them. Um, we also try to make sure that they have you know, hidden text. So um, you have an area labeled by in here, that area label is this. So if someone who is uh, uh, visually impaired starts using the website and you know, lands on this section, they will immediately, the screen reader will immediately be directed to this heading and they will know where they are and um, whether they want to move forward or read. The context and we also ensure that we have alternative text for all of our visualizations as much as possible or um, have a screen reader only text that directs people to a data table from which you can get the data that is presented visually in, in a specific visualization um, and it goes also beyond the website we make sure that uh, the even the you know google search results that, that, that you obtain are also accessible. So that's why you, when you search the website you know, during specific hours, you will get a, um, a summary of each section. So this is vaccination cases that healthcare. you get a summary of them uh, presented to you. These are the, the same content as you would get from our simple summary page uh, and download, which you could, which you could visit on uh, postcode and summary pages. And then we did a lot of user testing and our user testing goes with a twist in here. And there's a reason for that. Uh, it's very important to not confuse the user testing exercise with finding out what users like. Those are not necessarily the same thing. Users tend to like things that are nice and might, might prefer something that's, that looks cute or clean or you know, familiar to them. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it is a useful way of doing that thing. So that's what we need to determine whether whether what we are whether what we are going to adopt the means the you know methodology that we're going to adopt is it actually useful to the user or is it just looking nice? And finding that out requires us to to come up with a strategy that allows us to to establish that. And this is an example of such exercise. Um, so you could see that when we were working on, on presenting a visualization for vaccinations, we came up with different ways of visualizing it. And we asked a um, number of candidates what they think about each of these visualizations. And majority of them, as you can see here, preferred this one. Now, well, that's all very good, but what is it that you're trying to present here? Um, what we are trying to present as a part of this visualization is, is the, the underlying data and to, to help people understand the proportion um, of, of people who have been vaccinated with, with different doses. So for that reason, we then ask them so that you could see that these percentages are uh, blurred here. So we then ask them whether or not you could tell us what percentage this is showing. And that is when things got very complicated because almost nobody could you know, guess the correct percentage from either this or this, but everybody managed to uh, you know, read the correct percentage from the waffle. And that was the objective for people, for, for the visualization to be um, you know, representative of the data and be meaningful. Um, and, and at that point, Quite a few people switched sides, so they changed their preference from double bar to, <clears throat> sorry, to, to waffles. And that is why it is a journey. I mean, I've included some of the comments that have been made. You see that you know 30% initially preferred waffles, but then 30% also initial, uh, initially preferred double bars, but then switched to waffles. And at the end of the exercise, 90% of people who were tested, um, preferred waffles, and, um, and realized that it was a more useful uh, way of presenting the data because um, they, they, um, they were not initially familiar with this type of visualization. But then once it was, um, once we asked them, we didn't tell them the reason, the underlying reason why we are 
um, including that, but we want to ask them a question about the presentation. They themselves understood why is um, why this is uh, a better presentation than the other two, and then they themselves switch sides. So it's it's important to also ask the right question and and sort of we don't want to lead users to make a specific choice, but we want them to um, also see things from a practical perspective and not only as as a design concept because those are not always the same thing. And that it doesn't really end there. We continue to improve things. So for instance, in this case, you could see that we, we um, evaluate how people interact with the, with the website. And uh, in, in this specific case of uh, what I'm showing, uh, people realize that you know, tapping or clicking on visualizations or on graphs, and they weren't doing anything. So we um, did some digging again, you know, realized that people were uh, hoping to get the same effect from clicking on the, on the visualizations as they do from clicking on the links underneath each card. So we went ahead and made the visualizations clickable on the landing page so that people could you know, be directed to the um, details page for that visualization by just clicking on it instead of just going down there and clicking on the link, which they also do, but we, we could we made it easier. Transparency, which was Claire mentioned that we need to have open data. I, I classify um, open data as part of transparency because I think they are they are intertwined really. Um, this is an extract from um, uh, a, a, an interview that we did with, with the I newspaper back in February last <clears throat> February last year. And um, it, it, it's true to this day. So um, someone sitting at home in Newcastle sees the latest trends and graphs for the first time at 4 p.m., which is the same moment as the Prime Minister in his office in Downing Street does. Yes, the Prime Minister and other officials may get some bits and pieces of data earlier if they request it, uh, some headlines maybe shared with them 15, 20 minutes earlier as well. But if you want to see the trends and the graphs and the visualizations and the consolidated data in, in a way that you can compare them, that is uh, only available at 4 p.m. So they are in the same boat as the rest of us in the country. Now, open data has advantages and disadvantages. Um, advantages, uh, you know, as I've highlighted here, is that it helps people understand government decisions. So it kind of helps government also to justify the, the decision that they make, which can have profound impact on people's lives. Um, it, it makes data accessible to millions. It, it uh, improves trust, and that we have found that through our uh, through our surveys and research. And uh, plus, we, we really can't do it all. I mean, there is a lot of uh, that we do, but we can't really do it all. There are different types of visualizations, comparison, and you know, interpretation of data that we can't really do. And we've tried to stay away from interpreting the data. We always say that's not our job. We are publishers. We publish the data um, as they are presented to us in a consolidated and uh, consistent format. But what we wouldn't do is interpret the data because that is a slippery slope. Once we start interpreting the data, Different people may interpret the data differently. And then, you know, the one with the most power will usually win the argument. And that's not how it should be in, in, this, uh, in this type of uh, presentation. There are also disadvantages, of course. There is room for misinterpretation because, because you know, as, as you saw, we have up to a million, million and a half people, unique users, visiting the website every day. And some of them, Majority of these people do not have a background in public health or, or statistics or you know, medical science. So what happens is that you see something here and you read something into it that's not there, and that is a potential problem. So that we leave that to um, other people to correct. So um, be it the media, the government, you know, people uh, who contribute to you know, social media. Um, who are specialists in these domains. Um, it's also a lot of pressure 
to publish as soon as possible. There is a lot of pressure on us, and, and you'll see part of it in, in some of the coming slides. But, but um, we always people we have, we have people always asking us to, to you know publish a new metric um, because they've heard of that metric, and it, it's not really always that easy to, to source a metric and to you know create a consistent output of it and then you know publish it so it, it, there is a lot of pressure on us to do that and we have limited time for QA because we have to do this every single day and you saw there are there are a lot of different sources which need to be uh, which need to be you know uh, managed so that is also part of the problem and we don't really have any room for delays because um, if if a piece of data is delayed by two hours, it means that our publication will likely be delayed by two hours. And then there are double-edged swords, which can be interpreted as advantage and disadvantage in that there is rapid identification of mistakes, but that is both good and bad because we can make mistakes and they can get identified quite rapidly, but then it gives us the opportunity to fix those mistakes also quite rapidly. And there is a very growing demand for data. So we keep adding data people keep asking for more data. So what does it take for a team to handle this level of pressure? And this, you know, this is, this is a, this is a uh, graph of our traffic, our daily traffic. This is, a, this is 4 p.m. that everyone knows and loves. Um, <clears throat> what does it take for a team to do this and go through this for every single day? So this is now weekly, this is monthly every single day for two years. It is, it is a lot to go through. And it's a lot of responsibility for a team. And we, we didn't really have much resources when we started. Uh, we've now grown as a team, but we started as four or five people working on this thing. And then we've now grown to 25, six people um, who are not all working on the service full time, but at least we have more resources. Um, Open data, uh, as I said, could, could lead to rapid identification of mistakes. And we have 100,000 view, reviewers looking at the data and telling us the mistakes. But then also, something I always <clears throat> tell people is that our mistakes are read back to us on national television, national news, within minutes of us making the mistake. So we don't really have any room to make mistakes. I mean, you can see that on this day, the data were released at 1604, they were on Sky News at 1607. Um, again, on 16th of December 2021, they were released at 1601, they were on BBC News in 1612. So it is um, very important that, you know, if we make a mistake, if we do not make sure that the data presented, at least this headline figure is not correct, then that will be what you will see on the news in five minutes time. And that will have consequences, of course. Then we have, you know, um, uh, as I said, open uh, communication with people. So this, this is um, something that happened on a Sunday. We didn't have the data for England uh the death state of England and we decided okay right so let's just go ahead and publish what we have which was for I think Scotland and Northern Ireland at the time and uh republish things um uh, at a later time when we are uh when we're ready so basically release deaths later this means that deaths for that day would show as zero what we did was that we created a big yellow banner at the top saying, this is the case. So don't think that is actually zero. It is not, it was, I think, 90 something. Um, so make sure that you don't report this as zero. What happened was that every news agency reported that the UK has reported zero deaths. It was incorrect. So we started contacting them through Twitter and different means. And some of them corrected it. Some of them, well, I gave up checking after five hours, didn't. So um, these are things that for which we might be held responsible at the end of the day because, well, we published the data. Um, so 
there, there are two kinds of people when, when this type of mistakes happen. Some of them, and vast majority of them, tend to be people who tell us about the problem, sometimes by email, sometimes you know, by message on Twitter or something, and that helps us fix the problem. Then there, there are people who are a minority, but try to just catch us making a mistake and you know, ridicule or ridicule us of, or justify some of their unfounded conspiracy theories or something. But then at the end of the day, we consider both of these as our users and we take their views equally important because they're both equally important. They're pointing out our mistakes. Um, there's a different way of looking at the second group. Um, they inform um, the design of our user research sessions. They improve the robustness of our um, you know, standard operating procedures, they improve our QA process. So we integrate a, a specific mistake that, we, that has been identified into our QA process and they improve the design of our overall processes and, and uh, you know, the website design. They also help us uh, individually achieve inner peace by testing our patients uh, day in and day out by threatening us with all sorts of different things, but that's besides the point. Um, open data prompts, uh, trust. And that's very true because uh, as we added more data and started to uh, so started communicating with people on Twitter and through social media, through emails, and uh, you know you, you know told people about our open source code base. People uh, the, the the trust in the service overall started to increase. So um, you can see this this was about sixty one two percent. This was about eighty percent, just short of eighty percent, and this was ninety one percent. And uh, this one had I think close to forty thousand participants. Um, so yes, it has material impact on how people view the, the service and data. And the objective for us is people to actually trust the data. We try to be open and our openness helps people trust data. Our communication with people helps them trust data because they, they now have a face associated with the service as opposed to you know, having to contact cons to get the simple question answered. Um, we have created um, extensive um, systems to, to allow people to access the data um, with, with ease. So you have a graphical user interface for people to download the data easily, and uh, even tell them what's the latest data available for the specific area and the metric that they're choosing. You have a developer-friendly environment, which means that you have a permanent link in here that you could use in your code to download the data every single day if you want to retain the archive of our data as published on a specific day. So you could get the data as it was published on a specific day from the website directly, which is very useful for some researchers. Um, we try to make things informative, comprehensive, and easy to use, and that's always been the objective. And we communicate with different types of users, so journalists, you know, big scientists, government officials, to make sure that their needs are being addressed, not just what we think their needs are, but their, their actual needs. And that's why this API has been, uh, this, the API and the service generally has been praised for, for being uh, a, a, a great advancement in, in open data in the government. And as I said, it, it really helps uh, us, you know, um, you know, go further because we can't, as I, as I said earlier, we can't do it all, but uh, other people can. So uh, they tend to, you know, use our data and create visualizations, interpretations, and, and um, you know, innovative things that we wouldn't have the time or the platform to do. And that is always useful. So you could see you know, interesting in terms of you know, the changes in daily basis, or this is the, the map. Sorry, sorry it's, Paul, it's yes. Paul here from um, Open Data Saves Lives and Compare. Can I share the meeting? Just, I want to give ourselves a chance to answer some of the questions because there's loads of great questions coming in in the chat. So. Would you like to just um, sort of finish off, or do you want yeah, to take some questions now? Yeah, um, I, I can. I can finish it off in, in about two three minutes. That's okay. Cool. Sure. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so this is another example of people using the the service uh, for different purposes, uh, from non-governmental organisations to you know, 
uh, non not for profits and research organizations and so on. Um, open data, this is, this is one of the important things to me personally. Open data helps people in a material way in their lives. People make decisions on different activities in their lives based on the data that we publish on a daily basis. Whether they need to go to the barbershop or do their you know, daily shopping or whatever it is that they do, they use this service um, to make those decisions. And that is very important. We also have made our, um, our, all of our code bases open source, which means that people get to see our code that, that also helps them trust our, our work. And, um, and it also helps us um, you know, interact with them, improve our security, improve our code, and um, you know, create code that's more robust. And of course, it, it prompts uh, public engagement with our, uh, with our service so people engage in different ways with the service and, and uh, you know, discuss it across different platforms. And they also contribute to the service. So if they just come in, there is a mistake in here. If they go to the code, they correct the code, create a pull request, we review it. And if it is all good, we merge it and they will have contributed to the national service. So they will have a sense of belonging as well. And uh, yes, this is our future. So we are we have just in, included brain infections. We're working on the demographics of brain infections and variants in the future. And there might be other things that we don't know about yet. Um, yep, uh, I, I'll, I'll just leave it there. And uh, thanks to everyone who has contributed. But most importantly, um, many thanks to the analysts and people from different parts of government who have contributed to this. It wouldn't have been possible without them. That's it. Thank you. Fantastic. Fantastic. So um, I think um, we'll all give you a, a, a round of applause. Um, um, it, it's fantastic. So what I'd like to do is I'm going, I'm going to pick up some of the questions and um, straight away we've got a Claire, we've got a question for, um, for Claire from, uh, and yourself, Aurea. Um So it's a question from NHS digital it's about um use cases and iteration and feeding back and i'm i'm, I'm summarizing the question um but basically how do you gather the user feedback and how do you manage that and how do you do it at could, pace i guess that's the uh, that's the question paul could i could i just um just just tweak that out yeah, of course you can. It's your, if it's your question, Connor. Oh, uh, yeah, it sure. is. Yeah, why so, don't you go, and then yeah, yeah, I'll 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 stop. Um, so it's from the perspective of a data supplier, um, where we have a, a mix of good and and poor quality data going out sometimes, um, but it's difficult to know how that's impacting, um, and so I guess I'm looking for Claire, for, or for you for like a quote that I can then take and, and share around other teams to say, look, whatever happens, make sure you don't. I don't know change the formatting of column names or stuff like that and um, really basic things but but from a, a user of data perspective what can we do to make sure we're not going to trip you up at 3 45 p.m I mean, it does make us cry every once in a i mean that's a good one yeah don't change all your column headers on your spreadsheet <laughs> it's Base definitely formats. a good one <laughs> produce have an api that would very much help us, I think, because that enables us to feed that into our pipeline with much less intervention from us. But we take all sorts of things into the data pipeline from spreadsheets, through, and some things have to be manually entered. People email them in and they're manually entered to try and minimize that as much as possible. Um, but yeah, people do constantly change the layouts of their spreadsheets. I mean, yeah. just just um, ONS do this every single year. They change the format of their weekly deaths in January, uh, and it's broken our pipelines twice. We're working with them to try and get that into their API. I mean, if I had to, you know, recommend one thing is that, that just don't change the structure of data in any shape or form without notice, uh, either that, or maybe have a version uh, system. So, uh, you know, uh, if, you're if you're making a change and you just need to make it now and you can't take notice, maybe create a version two of that, uh, of that specific data set, retain version one for, I don't know, two months, 
uh, if possible, and then um, you know give notice that this will be de uh, decommissioned in two months. So you need to switch to from version one to version two, and that would give us time to to incorporate the changes without having to rush on a Sunday afternoon <laughs> to find someone to do it. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that's a really, really good um, good approach um, that, that we, we've talked about is just surface two, two versions and then start the, the ticking talk, uh, start the clock ticking. Yeah, so. don't change things on a Friday. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> just weekend and Friday. <laughs> So we have a, um, Stuart runs our Open Data Hints and Tips. Um, we've got a little GitHub repo, which we share hints and tips about open data. So maybe we could find that and put it in the uh, chat. But also if you want to add to it, um, please do that. And Connor, if you want to take that on and share that with colleagues, um, very happy for you to, uh, to do that. There's loads of great stuff um, in there. Um, I've got a quick question just on the, you know, the visualizations around vaccination uptake. And I, I know this might be really hard, but was there any um, feedback on whether it improved um, vaccination uptake by publishing that data? Um, none that I'm aware of. Might, might, it should, could potentially be done, um, uh, but uh, we could see, because we know when it was um, deployed, it might be possible to, to determine that. It might be slightly difficult though, because we didn't really have a general vaccination campaign. We had you know, age brackets that could go yeah. and get vaccinated. So in that sense, it's a bit difficult to, to work it out, but it's certainly possible because the dates are clear. Cool. Um, there's a question about the QA process. And I think a lot of people are talking about the, the, Q, the, the QA process and we would come from a, publish early, publish often, get early feedback, do it quickly, get into a rhythm. Um, but obviously we know that a lot of people get quite scared by that uh, approach and want to know that it's so accurate or precise before you publish. Um, so I guess if you could um, uh, expand a little bit about that. And there's a question from Edward about, have you got an example of QA failing? What happened? I guess you just, someone told you and you fixed it. So there's, there's not much drama. I got to talk about that, but, but um, Claire is the architect of our rapid QA system. Um, so I'll let Claire go with the QA. Yeah, bit. in terms of the QA at the end of the process, I suppose there's, there's QA built into the pipeline. So if data are coming in and they're not as expected, things will break, which then gives us time to work out what's going on and fix them and go back to the supplier if necessary for a new version. So that's one thing. If it all seems to have passed that kind of QA and it's pinged across to Puria, then it actually goes wrong. I mean, one classic example which Puria's eardrums haven't recovered from yet was when the, our email of early release came out and said there'd been zero cases and zero deaths um, yeah. reported that day. And I kind of mm. screamed down the phone. <laughs> I had my, my headphones in, so yeah. My there goes so, my yeah. <laughs> Something had gone badly wrong there. So we, we put in a fix to stop that happening. Um, yeah. So we gradually integrate and try to gradually automate them. But then also yeah. on top of that, Claire has uh, designed a system of, you know, representative data monitoring, meaning that, you know, um, She's, she's probably into more this stuff. And have you found have you found that people have become more forgiving of the data, and now people have accept, all ah, right, okay, data will improve over time, um, or, or they're expecting it to be? No, data yeah. should be one hundred percent accurate every day. <laughs> is uh, what's happening, and uh, that is what has been happening. Uh, if the data is wrong, and if it is. A, an important metric that's that's wrong yeah i mean if it's something that's not been updated today and it was supposed to be updated that we could say okay we can need to wait for it until tomorrow but if it is something that's materially wrong someone you know someone someone's maybe dozen or 200 people something between these approach me on twitter <laughs> and tell me about it and then they email us and then we just get uh, to work immediately, and sometimes we stay until 8 p.m., 9 p.m. 
fixing things. But, but that benefit of having many eyes helping you to fix things early is, is you know, it, it's yeah. um, super, super important. And I, I put that sort of, you know, real benefit of being open. Mark, you've got a question about sexy visualisation. Well, I, I, it was just a, 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 an observation, really. If you you sort of watch the, you know, the Boris sort of lectures on a Saturday night, as was, and I thought they weren't too bad um, in terms of their use of graphics. And But then I sort of talked to family and friends and they didn't really understand what was going on in them. And I just wondered, I was just curious mm. how, how they design what they're going to use. And then alongside that, how other visualizations like you know the waffle or the hex maps that you do how, how those kind of break through um it's just an observation really um given that you know they're putting out that data so widely how do they go about designing it you know they may be quite good at it but there's probably plenty of other people around them and i gave a couple of examples like yourselves who really really think about it in a lot more detail because they should be completely intuitive um as you know, as 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 some of the slides were starting to say, and that's why things like that waffle chart kind of break through because they they just seem to be more intuitive than something else. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. my view is as simple as possible. Yeah. So I I don't want anything much more complicated than a bar chart. Really, I'm not a big oh. fan of very complex visualizations on the dashboard because most people don't understand them, and this this site is aimed at the general public. I think if you're doing something that's aimed at a different audience, you can be a yeah. bit more sophisticated, but really for something like this, the, the general user really does have to be able to understand it. And then really you're quite limited in what you can do. I mean, I, I do like the waffle because I think that is easy for people to understand. And it's kind of amazing. It's not been used more widely before, I, um, I think it's going to get used a lot more. Um, yeah, I think the going to be. Yeah, it also depends on the type of you know uh, metric that you're trying to visualize. Uh, I mean, some metrics are, you know, more tend to be more popular in uh, amongst the you know, general public, and some are more specialist metrics like the you know the, the time series for the R value or you know. That type of visualization might be slightly more complex, which is something we also tested, but it's also not really I mean, general public who might not understand that uh, specific visualization. Don't, don't tend to go there and care much about the time series for it. Same goes for you know the heat maps. It might be that you know percentage of people may not understand the heat map. We could also show that as a line. Chart. I don't personally think showing that as a line chart is is useful because it, it gets very you know messy very quickly. Whereas you know heat map is is a is a more appropriate way of visualizing a uh, two dimensional data of that of that nature. Yeah, but, we're yeah, not going to go near pie charts, are we? Um, I don't think. Um, Nope. <laughs> Not while I'm in charge of the dashboard, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Stuart, Stuart, you've got a question. I'll just repeat. So this is like a positive one. How much have all the different input sources improved in reliability and quality over the pandemic? Or have they? I'm I won't say it because from Twitter it'll break. <laughs> if as soon as I say, oh, yeah, it's getting much more reliable. Everything's on time something will go horribly wrong. I mean, you've, based, you've got so many different data sources, even if each one is only fails on a very infrequent basis, because you're bringing together so many different ones, the likelihood of something failing on any one day actually becomes quite high. So, yeah. yeah. So the, I think we're sort of getting to the um, end of the session, but also the other questions. I've got one, which is, um, the great work of, or the, I guess it's the time. So we're, humans are weird in that we forget quickly about how mad it was at the start and how there was little data and how, you know, how the, the, the development of this data in this dashboard, I'm a, you know, how is this going to be shared, the, the learning and the, the code, because there's going to be a demand for this in so many other contexts now. Um, how are we going to be able to scale and share this 
um, not just in health, but others, you know, because it, you know, it, it seems to be stuck together a little bit with plastic, you know, sellotape from at the start, and now we've got it going. And Gloria, you're doing it as a, a, a benefit to the country at the moment, as far as I can work. You're, you're an honorary person. Um, so, so there's just, I guess, how we finish this off with, you know, what next? Yeah, well, we that's part, I guess, that's part of our work program over the next six months to a year, isn't it? About building on what we've learned, making sure lessons learned are not lost, building out the platform, potentially turning it from a tool to present data on COVID to something that can be used to present lots of different things. You know, it's, it, has, it has applicability to other infectious diseases, perhaps not daily data, but you know, I think normally sort of surveillance data, you think of kind of weekly publication, this could be adapted for yeah. weekly publication relatively straightforwardly. Okay. Probably yeah. all his eyes at me now, but relatively straightforwardly. Well, well um, the code it could be applied by others. And I think um, yeah. Connor, oh, myself and Connor sit, yeah, sit on a the open data working group for the NHS at the moment. And they're now looking at what they do next. And I think finding models and stuff we can amplify um, and build on so that we can look at one of the one of the um, uh, headlines that we put when we first started uh, open data headlines was share the data back. So this is a great a great um, example of local data or data being shared up to the centre, and then the centre sharing it back in well used, um, uh, no well structured data with good visualizations with an API that a local area could use themselves to build their own products to deploy again for something else and then we, we get that virtual circle so I think there's this is what I would hope is that we can start not just sharing the dashboards but the process of creating data assets and infrastructure yeah. Yeah. The dashboard is, you know, the dashboard is a great bit, you know, it's fantastic, but actually having the infrastructure that connects local and central and having not having a hierarchy, you know, that it's a, a you know, equivalence because something that's important locally may not, you know, so that, that would be my piece that that would, how do we share the infrastructure you've built and learning without having a major cost and hopefully scaling that across the, the different parts it's of the... Essentially, yeah. um, I've been thinking about this for a while. Uh, one of the things that I'm hoping to do at some point is to write a white paper on the way we created some of these mm -hmm. things and the standards that we applied, which have been adopted and, uh, and liked by a lot of people. So for instance, one of the main things that the dashboard offers is a place to get consistent data in a consistent structure and format with reliable um, you know, presentation and, and uh, structure um, on a daily basis. It doesn't have to be on a daily basis, but that is the main power of the, the service because you know, this consistency is what makes it very, mm -hmm. uh, very useful to people because you could, some Fantastic. of the data that we publish are already available. So Gloria, what, what, what we can do is we could in, maybe invite you to do a series of guest blogs on the Open Data Sales Labs website, which you can then turn into your white paper. Um, and we'd love to host that. But, you know, you just when you get time, you could write 500 words a time mm. on different pieces. I, and I then, do yeah, write yeah. blogs regularly, sure. Of course. Yeah. But, we, yeah but, if you, but if you want to find a place to put it, and we have found the Open Data Sales Labs, because we, we, we put it together, but lots of other different people have done uh, guest blogs uh, around different subjects that allow them to sort of get that discussion out there. So if, if you would like to, you'd be Absolutely. really welcome to do that. Absolutely. Okay, so we're up to, oh, that's the hour. Um, I, I, I don't want to take anyone more time, but I'd like to um, say thanks very much to Claire and Poria. Um, um, we'll be recording this, we'll put it on the website. If you've got any questions, I'm sure you can uh, find them through to us on the uh, on the twitters or, or by email or however you want to share it and we will try and um, uh, get an answer back from you but thanks very everyone much for joining and claire and poria anything like any last words thank you thanks for having us yeah you're most welcome cheers everyone thank you have a lovely Bye -bye. day